Good afternoon and welcome to the Art Museum of West Virginia University's Lunchtime Looks program. I am watching the attendees numbers click up as people are able to sign on. So I will give everyone a few moments to do that and then I will introduce our speaker for the afternoon. All right. And it looks like we've slowed down a little bit with people signing in, so I will start my introduction. Welcome to the first public program of the 2022-2023 year for the Art Museum of West Virginia University. My name is Heather Harris, and I am the Curator of Education here at the Art Museum. Before we begin, just a few technical notes. This event is being recorded and will be available fully captioned on the Art Museum's YouTube playlist in the days after the presentation. So should you need that functionality, it will be available on our playlist soon. Um, also, we will have a Q&A after the presentation and we ask that you use the Q&A function for the Zoom webinar rather than the chat. Um, we'll reserve the chat function for any um, technical issues or problems that you might have that we, um, but if you can't see or hear anything, let us know that in the chat and any questions in the Q&A. Um, and with that, it is my honor to introduce our speaker, John P. Murphy. Um, John Murphy is the Philip and Lynn Strauss Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center at Vassar College. And from 2018 to 2021, he served as the Hone Curatorial Fellow for Prints um, at the University of San Diego, where he curated story work, The Prince of Marie Watt, from the collections of Jordan D. Schnitzer and his family foundation. Um, as many of you know, story work is now on display in our own galleries here at the Art Museum of West Virginia University and will be through December 11th. Um, and we encourage all of you who can to come down here to Morgantown and see it in person because it's truly a stunning exhibition. And we're so honored to have John here today to talk a little bit about how he organized it, his curatorial process, and um, why it's so important to have this work um, on display in our museum. So without further ado, I will turn it over to John. Thanks so much, Heather. And uh, thanks to Todd and everyone at uh, WVU for the invitation. I'm just really thrilled that the exhibition is on display there and had a chance to look at some of the install shots that Heather shared. It looks stunning, uh, absolutely gorgeous and fascinating to see uh, an exhibition transform and take shape in, uh, in a different space. So uh, really thrilled to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and fire up the PowerPoint. I just have some slides that will kind of take us on just a little journey of how the show came to, came to be, how I was introduced to Marie's work and a few of the thematic touchstones. Uh, so if you've seen it already, hopefully this will en enrich your understanding of what you saw. Uh, and if you haven't seen it yet, uh, maybe this will give you a little bit of insight into the work uh, that you encounter when you're in the galleries. Uh, so just to recap a little of what Heather had said, this project came together as really my culminating exhibition for the three years I spent at the University of San Diego, uh, where I was working with uh, director Derek Cartwright. And part of the concept of this uh, curatorial fellowship, uh, which is specifically geared towards prints and the history of printmaking, uh, was to imagine a project that would bring together the three years of work and research uh, with an exhibition that uh, could potentially travel, would potentially have a catalog and have a life uh, after the University of San Diego. So when Derek and I were sitting down together early in 2018 and uh, the stages of my fellowship, uh, we discovered a mutual admiration uh, and affection and respect for the work of Marie Watt. Uh, this was an artist that Derek uh, had known for a long time and admired her work as a sculptor and installation artist. And we discovered uh, to our delight that she'd had also this long, uh, almost sort of sidetrack career as a printmaker and that her work as a printmaker hadn't yet really been brought together in, in one space or in one exhibition. 
uh, or in one catalog. And we thought this would maybe be a contribution uh, we could make would be to tease out this aspect of her practice uh, that hadn't uh, really had a lot of attention paid to it yet. Uh, so it's really fun for me to see, you see on the left, uh, an installation shot from San Diego, uh, and then on the right, um, the installation in the galleries uh, there at WVU. And I just love to think of how the show maybe changes or transforms or how uh, it can be experienced differently in a different, uh, in a different space. I wanted to share a, a quick video of uh, Marie uh, from 2017. This was actually how I was introduced to her work, how I first came to um, uh, learn about her practice as, uh, as an installation artist, a textile and fabric artist, a sculptor, uh, because she was doing a project at Northwestern where I got my PhD. And so this was the first time I heard Marie's name and uh, this video that the block did in relationship to her visiting Northwestern and being a part of the exhibition, if you remember, I'll remember, I think really gives you a sense of her sensibility, her character, uh, her uh, thematic interests, and uh, is just a nice way to segue into the print. So I'll share that now. So you can you tell me your name and what you do? My name is Marie Watt, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist who especially enjoys collaborating with communities. of my process is hosting open to the community sewing circles and I like to tell people that they can come and go as they want. Uh, I'll try to feed them but in this case I exchanged a uh, limited edition silk screen print and uh, no sewing experience is necessary. People as young as two and as young as 92 have participated and uh, people can come and go as they wish. And one of the things I think that happens when people sit down at the table to sew is your eyes are diverted and your hands are working with something really intimate like cloth, which we all know. Uh, there's no obligation to talk, but stories sort of flow. I'm here for a show called If You Remember, I'll Remember. And it's a show that uh, explores issues of memory, uh, loss, uh, xenophobia, and history. I think of a sewing circle as like a dinner party where you invite the guests and you set the table and then you just let it go sort of, it, it then goes on autopilot and becomes its own thing. I think that like the ideal outcome for me would be um, that that maybe I'll get to see people again, but also that people um, learn something about their neighbors and they might connect. So I think you get a sense from that a short introduction to Marie's time at Northwestern of just her sensibility, her interest in art as not just the expression of the individual solitary genius, which is uh, maybe a kind of conventional or received idea of the artist uh, solitarily working alone, painting in a garret somewhere, but uh, art is a means to connect people, a means of creating community. And you may have heard very briefly in that video, she mentions in passing these uh, gorgeous little silkscreen prints uh, that she gives as a gift or really a kind of barter 
uh, for people who come and join the sewing circles, she makes these really exquisite little um, Goko prints. It was a technology invented in Japan in the 80s, a kind of uh, almost Polaroid uh, version of generating a, a, a small silk screen. Uh, and she offers these to people who come. And so Derek and I were both really interested in the role that print played in Marie's practice and how printmaking connected to this uh, larger practice of the sewing circles, uh, her textile pieces, and uh, imagined an opportunity in the galleries to uh, sort of weave these different threads of her practice together, maybe in a way that they uh, hadn't been before. And I hope too that serves as a tantalizing invitation uh, for Marie being on campus uh, later this month. And uh, you get a sense of how enjoyable it is to participate in one of these uh, circles, which I did in San Diego. So just to uh, zoom out a little bit and think about Marie's uh, practice as a printmaker, it's really been there from the beginning. Uh, she studied printmaking as a graduate student at Yale University uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, she'd already gotten a master's from uh, the Institute of American Indian Arts. She'd studied printmaking a little bit as an undergraduate at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. Uh, but she described uh, sort of these experiments and engraving at Yale as some of the first serious instances of her taking on uh, printmaking to express uh, ideas related to her uh, native identity, particularly. She did these really quite exquisite uh, studies uh, of corn husks uh, that are very kind of minimalist and, and beautiful, uh, but she was interested in corn husks as they related to her Seneca heritage, uh, particularly corn as one of the staple crops of the Seneca, along with uh, beans and squash. Uh, sort of revered as the three sisters are a really vital part of uh, um, the Seneca heritage and identity. Uh, but you can see here that they're treated in these very um, pared down, uh, almost minimalist uh, kind of manner. And they're really uh, quite striking when you see them uh, in, in person. Uh, and they already relate to some of the things that she was doing sculpturally as well. Uh, she was also interested in uh, these planes that almost look like hair, sort of uh, lines of hair, uh, and that connected in her mind as well uh, with hair as a sort of marker of identity and uh, something that also is a marker of the passage of time. Um, so you'll note as we go through and look at some of her work that ideas about the body, passing of time, her native identity, uh, everyday materials, corn husks, uh, what kind of meanings do they accrue? What kind of significance uh, do they have um, either personally uh, or culturally? So that's, that's already there from the beginning, even as early as her time as a graduate student. I really think of 2002 as the year that she really comes into her own in a way as a printmaker. She does two residencies at two different uh, print studios. One, the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology on the Oregon coast and then the other, which we'll talk about in a minute at, at Crow's Shadow. And this really begins her uh, collabor collaborative practice as a printmaker. So something to keep in mind with printmaking, maybe different than uh, painting, for example, is that it's a very technical, can be a very technical medium. Uh, it can be challenging for someone who doesn't have a certain technical know-how or skill set if you're an artist to translate your ideas from say a drawing or a painting or another medium into print. And so often uh, there's a, a master printer or someone in a studio who can help an artist realize their ideas. And in the case of Sitka, that was a woman named Julia Diamario uh, who's worked with Marie on many, many print editions over the years. So that's also a characteristic of Marie's career as a printmaker is that she establishes these really long running connections and collaborations. Uh, and I asked her at some point, you know, is there a relationship between the print studio in your mind and sewing circles? And she said she hadn't really thought about it actually until the show really brought together her work as a printmaker, but she could see in retrospect uh, these interesting similarities between being in a space that is somewhat social. If you're in a print studio, often there's uh, lots of people around or working together 
The artist is working with a, a master printer. They're talking, they're having conversations. Uh, and she talks about the stories that flow when your hands are busy. Uh, you, it allows for a certain kind of relationship with someone, even if you don't know them that well, you often are able to get into a kind of flow of conversation and, and getting to know, know each other and telling stories while you're sort of preoccupied with something else that you're working on together. So printmaking is a collaborative medium, really in essence, and collaboration, I think, as you can tell already, is really essential uh, to Marie's practice. Uh, she was making these uh, really uh, ethereal, beautiful, evocative prints at Sitka, uh, and introduces early on this idea of the blanket. So the blanket relative that you see from 2002, I think uh, that's the earliest iteration of this blanket theme uh, that we'll come back to and revisit and is uh, central to uh, Marie's practice. But these are relatively small prints uh, and they really reward close looking and they don't reproduce particularly well digitally or on a screen. So this is another advantage of having Marie's work in the galleries, being able to see it uh, up close because they're very subtle, uh, very quiet and atmospheric um, and evocative. I mentioned Crow Shadow is really the other uh, formative print influence for Marie. This is a fascinating organization. Uh, it is I think I'm correct in saying the only professional print studio uh, located on a Native American reservation in the United States. So this is located on the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla uh, Reservation in Pendleton, Oregon, in Eastern Oregon. Uh, it got started in the early 90s by an artist named uh, James Lavador, who'd grown up on the reservation and then went on to achieve a certain level of renown and success in the art world and wanted to give back uh, to his community, to give back uh, to the reservation um, that had shaped him. And so uh, he got this um, program started kind of against all odds. Uh, and it's grown to become a really major force uh, in contemporary art uh, in bringing uh, to Pendleton native and non-native artists to uh, practice um, or to work as printmakers, some of whom don't have print experience before. Uh, and I'm showing a photograph here in the lower left-hand corner, and you see Marie down in the corner here, uh, the youngest member of this group. This is from the early 2000s when there was a symposium held at Crow's Shadow called Conduit to the Mainstream, where various thought leaders, curators, uh, scholars, artists, um, really invested and committed to making uh, Native American art uh, more accessible, broadening its scope. Uh, what would be sort of conduits to the mainstream, conduits to uh, the mainstream art world? And Marie has cited that experience at that symposium in the early 2000s as being uh, a really crucial moment for her when she was meeting curators, when she was meeting uh, artists that she admired. Uh, and respected, and uh, that led to her first uh, editions print, uh, working with Frank Jansen, who you see here up in the right-hand corner, and Frank has been uh, a long-standing collaborator of Marie's. Uh, he retired recently as, as the master printer from Crow Shadow, but over the course of 15 years, they uh, made something like 20 different print uh, editions together. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, stress the importance of Crow Shadow um, as an institution, as a place, as a creative uh, hub and uh, crucible to Marie's career as a, as a printmaker. Um, and she said that some of the early prints, these lithographs that she made with Frank uh, in the early 2000s uh, remain some of her, her favorites, although you know, you're not really supposed to pick favorites uh, as an artist of the work that you've made. But again, the, the beauty of these prints, um, that poetic, kind of austerity, uh, the, Frank remembered the commitment Marie had to getting exactly the right color. Uh, Frank and I were talking on the phone about the collaboration and he said he remembered in his mind, it was like hours and hours and hours uh, that Marie would spend mixing colors to get just, just the right uh, combination. And again, when you see these in person and you see the subtlety of them, uh, how incredibly atmospheric and beautiful they are. I think you can see the fruits of all of, all of that labor. 
Uh, so lithography is a challenging medium, and it's it's one that as as an artist you often rely on the expertise uh, or skills of a master printer um, to help you realize. So you really do see Frank uh, and his collaboration with Marie um, in in these early works in terms of translating uh, Marie's uh, drawings and her the work that she was doing um, in pen and ink. Uh, into these really subtle uh, and gorgeous lithographs that you see this theme beginning to emerge of weaving and fabric and textiles. She was interested in dream catchers, the motif of the dream catcher. A lot of her work in the late 90s, early 2000s is exploring this idea of sleep and sleep sleeplessness. Uh, and that's where you begin um, to get this interest in the blanket, particularly uh, the meaning and significance of, of the blanket. Um, and these are, uh, from what I can tell, some of the earliest iterations of this theme of the, the stack of blankets, the kind of column or sculpture uh, that Marie has since, I think, become quite known for, identified with. You see an example of it on the right uh, that's in the exhibition. And then you see in a lithograph a year later, also made at Crow Shadow in collaboration with Frank, you see the stack of blankets emerging again as a motif. And for Marie, the relationship between print and sculpture was she's exploring these ideas almost simultaneously. I, I asked Marie and she couldn't even entirely remember uh, which came first, you know, the sculpture uh, or the print. She was um, exploring these ideas, drawing these concepts, the prints were happening. She was also beginning to uh, reclaim found blankets from thrift stores. Uh, Pendleton, as I'm sure many of you may know, is known uh, for its, its blankets. So she begins to uh, create or assemble this concept of the stack of blankets, which for Marie, I know, has a lot of different references that she's um, alluding to. There's uh, uh, kind of art, art historical references. You might think of Donald Judd's minimalist stacks. Uh, that would be a reference. You could think of Constantine Brancusi's uh, uh, famous sculpture, Endless Column. Uh, Marie's also referencing uh, the Douglas firs, uh, the beautiful pine trees of her native uh, Northwest. Uh, also interested in totem poles of Coast Salish um, uh, Northwest communities. So for her, it doesn't have a single re reference. Uh, it's multiple, the kind of open-endedness of this idea of the stack of blankets. Um, she's interested in the idea of uh, ladders between earth and sky, our relationship to the cosmos, these uh, objects like ladders or like these columns or sculptures that um, bring these two spheres together. Uh, and I'd say if there's sort of one uh, body of work that Marie has probably become best known for, uh, it is it's these um, sculptural blanket stacks. So it's really great that um, you have uh, this example to see in the galleries and compare it to how she's working through these ideas in print. Um, another project that's related to this idea of the blanket and blanket stories were these lithographs uh, made in 2007 at the Tamarin Institute in uh, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, associated with the University of New Mexico. And it's one of the premier uh, print studios in the United States with a very long and, and celebrated history of artists that uh, have made um, prints there. But she was doing something really interesting where uh, when one of her exhibitions uh, was traveling or she was part of a group exhibition that was traveling and her blanket stacks were a part of that exhibition, she would ask visitors to record um, in the comments book in the gallery their associations or their memories uh, uh, related to blankets. And then Marie went back and transcribed the stories that people had written related to blankets that they had a particular uh, connection to um, positive, negative associations, uh, army blankets that soldiers had in the war, blankets that um, were handed down as heirlooms from relatives, uh, a, a blanket that a beloved grandmother made for someone. Uh, so all of these are transcribed in these, uh, you can see uh, letters and words that Marie has written out in this lithograph that then kind of form 
these stacks of blankets that you can see uh, silhouetted against the weave of, of words or sort of the tapestry of words and stories. Uh, so that is a really critical idea for Marie, the idea that blankets are carriers of these stories or carriers of meanings and associations. Uh, and that's partially where the title of the exhibition comes from, story work. You know, what kind of work do stories do? Um, how do they help us understand the world? How do they help us bridge um, uh, uh, generations and bridge cultures and bridge communities? It's the stories we tell. And Marie likes to quote um, a Klamath elder who said, you know, my story changes when I hear your story. I'm somewhat paraphrasing, but that idea that the stories we tell each other and the stories we tell ourselves are really how we make meaning of the world and how we understand uh, the world that we're in uh, together. Uh, part of her time at Tamarin making lithographs also had to do with this motif of the circle or the target that I wanted to mention as well as being another citation of Marie. So Marie's really interested in these symbols and how they become part of a cultural vernacular. So one very famous example would be um, this target motif uh, that Jasper Johns uh, is particularly associated with. So Marie, in her own words, she's a, she was interested in kind of uh, repatriating the target or reclaiming the target um, from its association with either Jasper Johns, you know, think of the commercial emblem or icon, the logo for Target, the, the store. Um, and she was interested in this idea of the circle uh, and circle as a, as a way of forming community. Um, her mother, who is a, an indigenous, um, an Indian education specialist outside of Seattle, would convene sort of conversation circles where, uh, as Marie remembered, everyone seemed kind of equal and on the same status and the same plane, everyone sitting in a circle. Uh, she's interested in the kind of inherited associations that we have with the circle, um, the sun and the moon and um, you know, the eyes, the first eyes that you see coming out of the womb and all of these ideas that uh, Marie wants the circle or the um, concentric circles to evoke uh, beyond just their literal association with someone like a Jasper Johns. Um, and I love that you can see how it moves across different media in the galleries. So you have threshold, this uh, large, beautiful um, uh, work of reclaimed wool. And then you see the stacks of blankets here uh, repeated as a motif. I'll just mention quickly too that it's been fun to see how uh, different works um, sort of look differently in different spaces. So because we had such limited space at the University of San Diego and didn't have the benefit of the square footage of uh, the galleries that, that you have, uh, we needed to tuck away this um, you know, beautiful uh, work, a uh, landmark, A Thousand Names, related to this lithograph uh, in a stairwell. It actually, I think, looked quite nice and seemed almost as if it was designed for that space in the library. Um, so it was an interesting way on a campus like University of San Diego, where we didn't have one dedicated space to show all the work. We had to kind of find these nooks and crannies and places uh, that we could put things in. And then it would mean that someone might encounter uh, Marie's work in a different context, just on their way to class or on the way there to find a book or they're studying. Um, so I did kind of like that, but I also think that having the work in the gallery in relationship to the prints uh, that were made uh, connected to it um, gives a different character and a different understanding of uh, what Marie meant by it. Um, just in a couple of minutes to leave time for questions and conversation, I want to mention a few projects uh, that Marie's done recently that I think sort of show the direction her work is going in. Uh, one is this beautiful print that you'll see in the exhibition related to a photograph, an archival photograph that she discovered while doing a research fellowship at the Smithsonian. And it relates to this potlatch that was held in uh, the early 20th century uh, off the coast of Vancouver, British Columbia. And in the coast Coast Salish tradition, these potlatches are gift giving ceremonies. They're um, a host family will give away uh, blankets or goods or food and um, sort of it's a different way of understanding wealth. It's not how much you hoard or accumulate. Wealth is really measured by what you're able to, to give back or to give away. And of course, Marie was very taken with this photograph that includes this blanket 
kind of soaring through the air uh, to the crowd below. And one of the things that Marie emphasizes is that this was actually an act of civil disobedience since potlatches were outlawed in the United States uh, and Canada um, through the uh, first uh, quarter or half of the 20th century. And so by even convening or holding this potlatch, uh, it wasn't just a celebration, it was also uh, this act of um, civil disobedience and, and resistance. Uh, recently, Marie's been really um, interested in the theme of companion species and she connects it to uh, the Seneca uh, understanding of animals as first teachers. Uh, so this relates to the creation story and um, a whole opening and in the sky and sky woman uh, falling through uh, uh, to, the, to the earth um, and helped along that journey by uh, animals. And so different clans uh, in Seneca Nation are identified with different animals and Marie belongs to the turtle clan of Seneca Nation. And so she was interested in this idea of how we relate uh, to animals as family, as kinship. Um, dogs particularly uh, are, are an animal that Marie has been incorporating into her work thematically uh, and taking from uh, other kinds of myth, uh, the Greco-Roman story of uh, Romulus and Remus who were uh, nursed back to health after uh, uh, being discovered in the Tiber River uh, by this Etruscan she-wolf. Um, and Marie was really interested when you look at this sculpture is of interested in the kind of harrowed, um, distraught expression of, of the she-wolf and with its ribs showing. And you get the sense that this is um, a real a sort of the burden of caring for others, uh, the burden of nourishing others, the burdens that, that mothers uh, have to carry. And if you can make out uh, the outline actually of the wolf is in this print, you can see the paw, the legs and the paws and the feet here. So she's outlined this image of the capital in wolf and then sort of overlaid onto it these uh, patches of text and textile with words related to this idea of stewardship, um, elder, provider, custodian, teacher, and then indigenous uh, arranged along the length of the print. This was a print that Marie made at Smith College with Julia Diamario. So you can see them in action here, uh, making this print using a soft ground etching technique. And the motif here that I just want to um, connect to this really large reclaimed wool blanket, a companion species field that's in the exhibition. Very fortunate um, uh, that at your galleries, you have the room to install this. I think it's something like 24 feet long, a really gigantic piece. So we had the challenge in San Diego of where to put it. Um, so the library came to our rescue again. Uh, we had a bit of an annex uh, space in the library where we were able to just barely fit <laughs> uh, this blanket piece. You can see it goes almost to the ceiling uh, and included some of the, the, this bronze sculpture and a few other works uh, related. So in our case, we were really dealing with um, pieces of the exhibition kind of scattered around campus. And you know the advantage of that is that people who might not be intending to go directly to the exhibition or see it, they might encounter the work in another context or another format. Uh, but I love that it sort of offers this um, really interesting kind of way of connecting to her work as a printmaker uh, in the space of the gallery. So it has uh, potentially different valence. Um, I'll just mention the importance of Marvin Gaye and the album What's Going On from the early 70s to Marie's recent work. She's taken lyrics and lines and words uh, from that uh, famous anthem and incorporated it into her prints and textiles recent, recently, you see examples of it here in this woodcut, you know, love in here today, war, conquer, hate, too many dying. Um, and this motif of actually a dog's tongue. So this sort of pink motif here is related to uh, um, the tongue of a dog that she wants to remind us of our kinship and relationship to animals and speech and breath and um, how we take in nourishment. Uh, the last slide I'll show here is just Marie's prints have gotten bigger and bigger over the course of her career from the small sort of exquisite Sitka prints. Now they're almost tapestries, they're almost textiles 
uh, themselves. And she's begun to convene almost printing circles in relationship to her sewing circles where uh, people will kind of make these small relief prints uh, that Marie then um, sort of stitches together or collages into these much larger, uh, almost tapestry-like prints. So in a funny way, it's an interesting moment to be doing a, a retrospective of Marie's work as a printmaker because I think her practice as a printmaker and a textile installation artist are, are beginning to merge together. Um, so with that, I'll conclude and look forward to questions and comments and just thank you all for your kind attention and hope you'll have a chance to see the show in the galleries and see uh, Marie when she's on uh, campus and experience firsthand her warmth and generosity uh, as an artist and as a human being. So thank you. Yes, and thank you so much, John, for um, I think everyone's got a, a deeper uh, understanding of that exhibition now, and we really hope you will have a chance to come see it. And at the very end, I'll provide a few more details about dates and times for Marie's visit so that you can make sure to put those on your calendar. Um, but for now, if anyone has questions um, uh, in the Q&A, if you want to put those in there, and while I'm waiting for people to kind of gather their thoughts and type, maybe I'll start with one. I think it's interesting. Um, coming from the University of San Diego, now here in West Virginia, and we were just speaking, we'll continue on to some other academic institutions. What do you think the significance of the role of kind of education also plays? You mentioned um, Marie's mother and kind of a lineage there. And I'm interested in, in why it feels important to have this particular exhibition going around toward academic institutions and galleries and how that kind of plays into her practice. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Heather. It's a really good comment. Um, yeah, Marie's talked about uh, the significance of her mother as an, as an educator, and in a way has been a little cheeky about the fact that um, she felt uh, when she was young that she was sort of dragged to some of these things, somewhat kicking and screaming, uh, not always, uh, you know, not always a, a keen and enthusiastic uh, uh, recipient of her mother's knowledge, but would, would later came to understand the importance and the significance of the kinds of conversations that uh, her mom was convening. Um, and I would just mention here as well, uh, Mar uh, Marie cited the importance of uh, uh, the Seneca Nation as a matrilineal uh, society, particularly. So the importance of generational knowledge passed down, uh, particularly through women. Um, coming out of Yale, Marie's first job was teaching at Portland Community College in Oregon. Uh, and I've talked to Mar Marie about that, even the idea of the community college as, as a space, particularly where people are coming from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic uh, experiences, different ages, and what it's like to teach art. At a, at a place like that. It's literally a community college. So the importance of community and collaboration to her uh, practice is something that was really embedded from, from the beginning. It was interesting. It took, uh, it, Marie has described the sewing circles came together almost by virtue of necessity. I mean, she had deadlines. She's a mom. She's a teacher. She had all these other responsibilities. And she had shows that were coming up and she had these ideas for these big textile pieces that um, take a lot of work. <laughs> they take a lot of uh, time and a lot of hands uh, to make happen. So she just started inviting friends, acquaintances, bring, you know, bring someone and I'll feed you. I'll give you a print. Uh, it'll be a fun time. Uh, we'll share uh, stories and we'll share space together. Um, and Marie came to realize that it, what started as something that was uh, kind of a means to an end, she just needed to get these things on the wall and was up against deadlines, really became the, the art itself, really became the work itself in, in her mind and in her, in her view. Uh, so it connects, you can connect it art historically to, you know, Joseph Boys or social sculpture, or there's all kinds of ways of framing it. But I think for Marie, Ultimately, the just experience of sharing space with people, talking, convening um, conversation and dialogue, and the importance of just uh, having something to do. I mean, if I, I did one of these in San Diego, it was, it was fantastic. And I had no sewing experience really whatsoever. It's just very inviting. It's very warm. Bring whatever knowledge or little knowledge you have. And there is something about uh, 
being busy, like with your hands while, while you're doing something, sitting around a table uh, that just allows a certain kind of unselfconscious conversation to happen really organically. And I think that's what Maria is interested in. So, you know, if any of you uh, do end up participating in one of Marie's uh, sewing circles, you will inadvertently be part of a work of art. <laughs> yes. And we're, like I said, we're so excited for that to happen. And um, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned in a few different places, also um, the art historical connections and references that appear and in Marie's work. And we have a question from the audience now. Um, first, it starts with a compliment. Uh, Judith Stitzel says that she's humbled, exalted, and amazed. So I, I hope that both you and Marie take that as, as beautiful praise for the work that, that she has done and that you've organized. So thank you. Um, but her question comes from um, uh, building a connection between especially Judy Chicago and the dinner party. I think thinking yeah, about yeah. Um, collaborative things uh, also through the flower and particularly also the AIDS quilt um, yeah, and that yeah. kind of social movement and action around um, collaborative textile work that happened with the AIDS quilt. So I don't know if you, you have anything you can add to that. Well. Yeah, no, I think those citations are, are spot on. Uh, I know that um, Judy Chicago is someone that uh, Marie is interested in. Uh, in terms of printmaking, it's interesting. I know she also really loves Helen Frankenthaler. So if you've seen any of Frankenthaler's uh, woodcuts um, or her work in different media, that's also a citation. Um, again, thinking of this matrilinearity of Seneca culture, one artist I know that Marie has um, consciously uh, um, cited in terms of her work as a printmaker is also Miriam Shapiro, uh, sort of genera generationally of the same uh, period as Judy Chicago. And those prints I showed that um, they almost look like fabric pieces, the kind of patchwork quilts with the words on them. I mean, those actually are fabric pieces. So this is where print and textile come together in a very literal way. Uh, because it's a soft ground etching technique that uh, Miriam Shapiro used in the 60s and 70s to take, you know, lace doilies, for example, or, or fabric runners or things that were associated with women's work or domestic work uh, that were often anonymously made. We don't necessarily know the names of the people who, who made them and would use that fabric to press into a soft ground on the copper plate. And then when you run that through a press, it sort of prints or imprints the, the fabric, the texture of it onto the plate. And so it somewhat removes the quote unquote hand of the artist and connects a little bit more closely to this idea of anonymous uh, women's work. Um, so I think that Miriam Shapiro in that series, Anonymous Was a Woman, is something that I know Marie has, has self-consciously uh, evoked. Uh, but I think absolutely the AIDS quilt, the idea of social practice around uh, quilt making, um, around uh, sewing circles, the, lo the longer history of sewing circles in native communities, particularly, and the significance of them uh, to Marie's practice is something she's uh, very conscious of. And I think Marie likes to somewhat subvert or play with um, these uh, canonical associations we have. So I think that idea of repatriating the target motif, for example, it's like, well, it existed a long time before Jasper Johns started making paintings of it. It has other contexts and other ways of understanding it. Um, and uh, the other group that I know Marie's uh, cited as well is the G's Ben printmakers in, in Alabama as well, who've also made beautiful prints uh, related to their work. So. Um, great insight, uh, really good comment. I think that's uh, spot on with um, what Marie's thinking about. Yes, and I should also add that in um, we currently have an exhibition titled Femfolio that includes <laughs> a print by Miriam Shapiro in our lower gallery where we're highlighting some of our collection work. So if you are interested in coming to see that kind of connection that um, that John's talking about, you can actually uh, see that in, in our gallery spaces right now. So um, just okay. another little plug for a reason you should come, come here in person um, and kind of make those connections for yourself. Um, so we have a question from a student who was in the gallery and I think felt connected to a, a, a piece called Transit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that he was, he was wondering what feelings were um, evoked for you with that particular piece. Um, 
Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. What feelings did it evoke for me? I mean, one thing, you know, that's from a series that that Marie did at, at Tamarind. And uh, yeah, I think she was interested in, you know, this idea, well, even the word transit um, uh, suggests something that's kind of transitory or moving from one place to another. Uh, she talks about transportation objects, blankets as transportation objects that move from one space to another, uh, that move through time, that are passed down through generations. So the transmission of knowledge, the transmission of care. This is partially where story work um, comes in as a title. I mean, that's from an indigenous theorist, Joanne Archibald, who is thinking about story work as really um, uh, trying to communicate or transmit uh, values of respect and uh, reciprocity and reverence and synergy and interrelatedness. Uh, so when I think of transit, I think of also just the, the subtlety of it, the beauty of the colors, the care that Marie took. Um, Frank, uh, you know, was somewhat um, jokingly complaining about, I mean, Marie would spend, I think he said seven hours uh, was a number he had in his mind, mixing colors, you know, just the care and the attention. And that's, where seeing things in person, and I think uh, the student in identifying transit as being a great example of like the, the subtlety of Marie's color choices, uh, the beauty of the forms, they don't, it's been interesting to see uh, Marie's uh, practice evolve too. Some of the earlier work sort of smaller, ethereal, um, that gets bigger over time when she starts introducing text. It's an interesting kind of dynamic that shifts or changes in the work too, where it becomes, uh, it has also a different kind of character to it. So thinking about um, the arc of Marie's a career as a printmaker and how it tracks with some of these changing and evolving uh, commitments and interests. Um, but I'm really glad uh, Transit uh, spoke to the student. Um, I agree, I think it's a beautiful uh, lithograph and I would put it in relationship to the other works that she made at, at Tamarind around the same time uh, and just connected to that, that idea of um, shapes feeling fleeting and time passing, uh, um, but not necessarily needing to be a sad or tragic thing if we're thinking about how objects like blankets can also connect us across time and space. Yeah, and when I saw Seth's question, I started to frantically think if I could find an image to place in. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. But also then I've, I've decided that that's actually just, again, a further plug to come down and see it in the oh, galleries yeah. because you yeah. really do see that just subtlety of detail and texture that is really hard to communicate on the screen. Um, but, uh, and we don't have any more open questions from the audience. I think um, I'll ask one more I, before we round out. And then, like I said, I'll share some details of her visit. So as you can tell, I have a, a, a bit of a one track mind thinking about education and our role here as an academic institution. So you've talked a lot about Marie's career trajectory and I'm just interested, especially for our art history and um, uh, studio art students who are here, if you could talk a little bit um, about your career trajectory, uh, especially in terms of that idea of a curatorial fellowship and where that lands you coming from research and moving into the curatorial realm. I think that um, hearing some of those experiences is really valuable for our students as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, happy to. And thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, so did my PhD at Northwestern. And, you know, one thing I would say is as I started the, um, the program, I'm not sure I was really aware of, of museums or other, I, I think you go into a program and, and you sort of automatically think professor, you think tenure track, or you think you know, a certain way of, of imagining sort of what channels you get, you get grouped into. Um, but I sort of by chance had an opportunity to do a fellowship, a curatorial fellowship at the art museum uh, on campus at Northwestern at the Block Museum. <clears throat> and speaking of collaboration and community and connecting, um, it just really kind of fell in love with, a, with uh, a different kind of teaching that's based on objects in space, you know, that's based on artwork that can be catalyst for conversation in the gallery. I know, Heather, this is what you do all the time. Uh, so I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, but also the different kind of communities that come in. I love that so many campus-based museums, many of them free, open to the public, uh, convening these kinds of conversations, inviting artists to come. Uh, and 
you know, uh, elementary school kids to, I mean, what did Marie say? As young as two, as young as 92, you know, so running uh, this, this gamut. And uh, so I would just encourage anyone who's thinking about art history or career paths or other ways of working in the arts, that there's just a lot of different ways to have art be a part of what you do and a part of your work and a part of your career. And museums for me were a space where uh, a lot of collaboration happens, a lot of conversation, you're working on a team. And so it, Marie's work fits, I think, perfectly in that milieu. It's interdisciplinary, you can get people, conversations happening. And what I love is in the space of the gallery at a campus museum, people bring their different um, backgrounds and knowledge and expertise to bear on what it is that they're looking at or thinking about. So what how a geologist might look at Murray's work, you know, versus a, you know, a poet uh, versus a musician and everyone will see and kind of understand and interpret the work differently based on their own uh, background and expertise. Um, so I would use the museum as a resource, particularly I'm sure you have probably students who, who work there, uh, Heather at the Loeb at Vassar College, we have student internships and fellowships and ways that students can become involved and, you know, just get to know a little bit about uh, who does what and different uh, ways that you can engage either, whether as um, a curator or as an educator or as a registrar. I mean, you know, there's just so many different facets and so many different elements that go into putting an exhibition together. Uh, that I had no concept of even as a graduate student. So the earlier, if you're interested, the earlier you get involved and start to learn more about how those organizations work, uh, the better. Great, thank you. And I, I appreciate that. That's exactly, it was a bit of a leading question because it, <laughs> it is what I do all the time and am very passionate about within the academic setting. So I really appreciate you affirming that for our students and talking about your own path and trajectory so that they can hear different stories. And thank you also for your time and, and sharing with us about your, the exhibition and about Marie and her work. It's really been a fabulous afternoon. And thank you for everyone joining us. And as promised, I'll tell you a little bit about Marie's visit here to campus. So she's going to be here from September 20th through 23rd. And there are going to be a lot of very exciting things happening. So please also, I'll say a couple things quickly now, but I know not everyone's sitting here with their phones and their day planner. So please follow um, the uh, Art Museum social media channels, check our website um, for further information about all of this. But um, on Tuesday the 20th, she's going to spend some time in our printmaking studio with our printmaking area coordinator, Joe Lupo, as well as his students and very excitingly 30 AP art students from Harrison County um, who are going to, be, going to be coming in um, to experience actually getting the chance to make prints with Marie. And then Wednesday is her public day that we hope to see you. She is also being honored as the Native American Studies Peace Tree Guest of Honor. The Native American Studies program here has a peace tree planted on our downtown campus. Her honors um, a Native person as the um, Guest of Honor in that ceremony uh, that uh, celebrates the formation of the Iroquois Confederacy. And uh, this year, in collaboration with this exhibition, Marie has been chosen as that guest. There's a very beautiful ceremony that includes music, um, reciting of some of those founding stories, and also we've heard birds from the Raptor Center <laughs> um, downtown. Uh, so please uh, join us at noon um, in the downtown campus. Um, there is The tree is actually near Woodburn Hall, and we have a rain location, the Gluck Theater of the Mountain Lair. That evening, Wednesday the 21st, will be her public artist lecture at 5 p.m. And then Thursday, um, as has been previewed and teased, she will be doing a couple sewing circles. Um, a few are going to be specifically targeted at students and classes. There will be one in the morning. Um, but in the afternoon from 3.30 to 6 p.m., we're going to send some invitations more broadly. Um, so please check your emails, check our social media, because we would love for you to come and join us and uh, meet Marie and do and make with her on uh, Thursday the 22nd. So um, like I said, that will be a really exciting week. And I think that this was actually the perfect groundwork to get people excited for that and um, ready to enjoy and experience her visit. So we're really tremendously grateful to you, John. And thank you to everyone who's joined us here today. All right, have a good afternoon and take care everyone.